Hey guys, it's LB Blake, and this is me not writing. Cheers. Today I am drinking a relatively flat Prosecco because that's what's in my fridge. And I have been running around all morning. I had to go to the DMV, which my DMV doesn't take appointments, so I had to wait in line for an hour before it opened. It was like 50 degrees, which is really not that cold, probably. But here, that, it was not great. It wasn't great. Yeah, so for proof of residency, you have to have like a bill, right? But who still gets paper bills? I'm trying to save the earth. It was a whole, it was a whole thing. And then I had to walk to the library and then the library was closed. I'm having a day. So leave me with my flat Prosecco. This is just what the world is today. Oh yeah, also my sweater. <laughs> This is one of my favorite sweaters. I've worn it so much it has a hole in it, probably from pulling it off the hanger. One of these days I'll learn to take care of my things. Okay, so someone asked me if I could talk a little bit about bipolar disorder. So I guess I can tell you a little bit about what it is and then my experience with it. Um, so basically when you have an emotional reaction, <laughs> emotional reaction, like an allergic reaction, that's not quite what I mean to say, but when you're having, when you're experiencing an emotion, something happens to you, right? And then your brain responds. It like has a chemical response to something that's happening to you. So basically what bipolar is, is that you get that trigger for an emotion, but then it sends like the wrong response. That doesn't necessarily mean that a sad event is going to trigger depression. Getting married, for example, I remember this being one of the stories that stuck with me as this woman like, married the love of her life and then fell into a depression for like several months. Um, so obviously it's bipolar. There are two poles. One is the depression aspect of it. And then the other is mania or hypomania, depending on what type you have. Um, I'm type two. I've only had one true manic episode. Um, and it was, well, I just, I didn't sleep for about 72 hours, I would say. And immediately before that, I had slept for 72 hours straight. So basically, I mean, you can see how this could be a problem, I'm sure. Um, my doctors would always, and, and the other thing about bipolar is it can't be treated the way that depression can. Depression is a little bit more like, clinical depression is more of a constant state. Um, so when you treat clinical depression, you can use antidepressants to like perk you up. But with bipolar, when you take an antidepressant, that shifts you into mania, which many doctors are very fearful of doing because mania like kills brain cells. <laughs> and it can be the most dangerous. I had a lot of clients actually when I worked for the public defender's office who were bipolar and um, so they would get diagnosed and that was part of our defense. And the stuff that happened to them while they were in the midst of a manic uh, episode is just like, you kind of lose your inhibitions, I think is like the, the technical word for it. I had one, I had one client who felt like he was in like a high speed car chase. And so he ran a red light and ended up hitting someone. So when bipolar goes untreated and the other thing about bipolar, so it gets diagnosed when you're in your late teens and early twenties, uh, or it doesn't begin to show signs until you're in your later adolescence. But if it goes untreated after that point, it gets worse. Um, so the older our clients were that would go untreated or undiagnosed, usually undiagnosed because it's not, it's, it's really, because mental health is so stigmatized, it's really unlikely that people seek out mental health treatment. Um, it's the sort of thing that like gets, you know, brought up to you in college, for example, like the first time I ever tried to talk to someone was at the like counseling center at my university. I did not actually get diagnosed then. Uh, they kind of indicated that they thought there was something like quite wrong with me. And rather than go back to find out what it was, I just like ran away from it forever. Um, <laughs> well, I thought I was going to run away from it forever. I think the thing is you kind of recognize that something is wrong. It didn't feel like I was coping. It just felt like I was in college. And if like I wanted to get really drunk one night, that was just this thing that I was going to do. Or if I wanted to spend a ton of money or if I wanted to go after some guy I knew was like a terrible idea, that just seemed like it's college and I'm young. But I think in the back of my mind, I knew like there was something there that I didn't have a lot of control over. But the only time that I actually 
decided to go see someone about it is after I met Mr. Blake and he was like, okay, so it's a little hard for me to understand what's going on with you. So I really didn't get treatment until I realized there was somebody else dependent on my state of mind. Because it had always been me. So if I was in a bad mood, then I was in a bad mood and whatever. But with him, he kind of needed to understand what was happening and therefore I needed to understand what was happening. So um, bipolar is usually treated with, it's treated differently than depression, like I mentioned. You don't, uh, very rarely would I ever give an antidepressants. Um, more often, I would, I mean, this, the base treatment is lithium, uh, which like builds up in your blood. So it's supposed to like sustain you over time. I use some antipsychotics, which sounds like terrible, but again, is to control that sort of like misfire. Um, I've described being on medication before as like, hold on. So if your emotions, it, it you know, for me, my emotions naturally range from here to here, let's say, at a really extreme high where I can't sleep and I'm just talking all the time nonstop and my thoughts are rambling and no one can understand me and just like I have so much energy, I just like have to get outside and literally run around because I have so much energy. That's up here. Down here is the I can't get off the floor, I can't decide what to wear today, I don't like, I can't really even figure out how to get in the shower. It just seems like too much work. That's down here. So what medication basically does is it takes your emotions and kind of goes like this. So it kind of, you don't feel as much. Um, I'm trying to say this in like a, I don't want to be like for or against medicating because, I mean, sometimes you need it. I definitely needed it at the time. I don't right now because I don't have that many like triggering things around me and I spend all my time doing creative work, keeps my like mood mostly balanced. That works for me. And it, I think it could work for a lot of people, but other people have desk jobs or um, need to be around people where they can't necessarily control their reactions to things. So they need medication because they need that like, you need to shrink sort of what's going on around you. The, that's how Xanax works too. Um, if, you have, if you have anxiety, basically if you're like, if this is where the level of like things that bother you is, so like everything under here is fine and then when you hit that, you get like anxiety, anxious response to something, Xanax raises that bar to up here so that you can continue to float around on here like unaffected. It doesn't like make you calmer, it just makes, the things around you, your ability to be around, to be, your ability to exist in your surroundings is higher. What was I saying? Yeah, so for me, when I was on pills though, it, it shrunk my experience like this, but it also was at the lower end. So I would not experience too many emotional highs. Um, more often, if my mood was gonna dip, it was uh, to, to being depressed. Um, so yeah, tough, but you know, one thing about being bipolar is that it has taught me that nothing really lasts. Um, I'm usually, I am a version of myself that exists on a cycle that I have almost no control over. It's just today I feel like this, who knows what I'll feel like tomorrow. And, um, that unpredictability is, has become almost reliable, which I know is an oxymoron, but, uh, I think I, the more I know about what's going on with me and my emotions and how I'm feeling, um, the better I have a sense that it could be different tomorrow. Um, actually it will be different tomorrow, which is what helps me get through things. Okay, so let's see. Hi, Olivia. I've been really overwhelmed with work and I've been experiencing sporadic palpitations as of late. Oof. The whole thing has in turn hindered my performance. This crunch period will be over in a few weeks. I've been handling it fine for the last few months, but things have been more difficult lately. Aside from staying balanced and healthy, do you have any general tips to tackle stress? What do you do when you need to keep focus for long hours? In times of low motivation, what keeps you going? Um... Well, I say all the time to set achievable goals or at least like measured ones. Um, 
when you're looking at a big task, you have to break it down into smaller pieces. Um, I mean, that's just, that's not even a stress relief tactic so much as just that's how you get things done. You say, I'm going to get this. No, you say, knowing myself and knowing how much I can do without going crazy, this is how much I'm going to get done today. And I'm going to hold myself accountable for getting this thing done. And you do have to bounce, you have to adjust those expectations depending on which you you are. So you may not have two poles of emotions, but you still know when you're more productive or less. Um, and knowing those things and then sort of acting accordingly is, I think, one way to manage stress. So I'm writing a literary manuscript right now and, um, for the first few weeks, I set a goal of about 10,000 words a week because in the past, that's been as much as I would write uh, for for Inheritance and for Masters of Death, actually. Uh, my goal while writing was 10,000 words a week, and it was usually not a problem. Like, I could even have done more. So I sat down to do this literary manuscript thinking I could do 10,000 words a week, and I got to, like seven or something and it was just like it had taken way longer than I thought and I had to readjust my expectations so at this point my goal even though it takes me it takes me the same amount to write 5,000 words for this manuscript as it does to write 10,000 for things I've written before um but that's just something that I've had to understand about is understand about myself so there's no there's no blame you know there's no like why can't I do this faster it's just this is how it has to be done. And as long as I'm getting done exactly what I need to, I'm staying on task for the expectations, the reasonable expectations that I've set for myself. I think really, if you can give yourself some sort of ritual for getting through the next few weeks until this project is over, that would be best. So I've said this before, but go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. Be as rigid as possible just because the more you rely, the more like you don't have to think about your schedule, I think the better off you'll be. You want to factor in uh, showering. Um, this is like, I mean, I've already brought it up, but like self care is really the first thing that goes out the window. Um, exercise, whatever exercise that is, whatever you like to do, you could do, don't think of it as. I mean, I don't know that you would, but definitely don't think of it as a waste of your time. Sometimes, sometimes I do feel like, why am I doing this thing when I could be working? I'm going to back up a little bit. So I schedule myself time off um, and I really kind of hate it because I really like to work and I really hate it when I'm not getting enough work done. It Anytime I'm not working honestly feels like a waste of time to me, um, but... I've learned at this point that if you are working too hard, you will sort of snap at some point. You will burn out. And getting through that burnout takes so much more energy than if you just take some time for yourself on a regular basis. So for me, like Fridays, not a lot of work gets done on Fridays. So I give myself permission to take most of Friday off, if not all of it. Um, so definitely give yourself time off and you don't have to do that as one day a week, but like give yourself an hour a day to do whatever you feel like doing that day. It is not a waste of time. It is something that is meaningful for you. I would fill it with something productive, like, um, I don't know, read a book or something. If, if you want to let your mind rest, um, go to the gym, go to a class. I think classes work really well if you can find like, you know, a yoga class or something because um, they happen at the same time. So you can just schedule that right in. Um, like going to the gym on your own sometimes feels like it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so when you have somewhere you've, you're just like, I've already scheduled this out and I've already told myself I'm gonna be there. There's no surprises. That can sometimes work better. If you wanna just like, sit, like, I don't know, take a bath, meditate. Like if you just need quiet time, do that. If you just want to listen to music, if you want to cook yourself a nice meal. When I'm really depressed, actually, I often cook like extravagant meals because there's something very fulfilling about creating something and then enjoying it. 
And that process of reminding yourself of something that you love and that is enjoyable to you is can kind of keep you afloat. However you need to get through it, just definitely give yourself the time and the ability to get through it. Definitely do not underestimate exercise. It's going to feel like a slog no matter what. Like dragging yourself to do anything, even if it's just to go outside and go for a walk, especially in the winter, it's so hard. I always think like, oh, I've got a headache. I don't want to go to the gym. But usually going to the gym makes me feel better. Cramps. When I have cramps, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to work out now. But actually exercising does make it better. But whatever exercise is for you. It doesn't have to be super intense. If you take a walk outside, you know, whatever you need to do, just sort out what you need, schedule a time to do it, and then make sure you do it. Rewarding yourself for, and yeah, and, and reward yourself for meeting the goals that you've set. Yeah, you want to be low on spontaneity right now, which probably sounds very boring, but that's that's what's going to help you get through this, especially if you're having like physical health problems, then you definitely need to schedule time to take care of yourself. However you do that. I don't know what your job is, so I don't know if this is a thing, but you can ask for help. Um, I know this is a silly thing to remind you um, because obviously it really depends on the context, but I think people often forget that You know, usually you do have resources or a team or someone who could help you. Just don't forget that you can ask for help. Um, I mean, that assumes that you have someone in your workplace that you trust, uh, but it is an option um, because if something happens to you, if your health gets worse, I mean, this project is definitely not going to get done. So don't. Don't be afraid to make yourself a priority. I mean, that this is all like basic information, I feel like, but you know, do what you got to do. The better you take care of yourself now, the less likely you're going to just explode when the pressure is even higher, you know, when you get closer to that deadline. So, yeah. I mean, all of this is stuff I've said before, but just Take care of future you because future you is important too. I mean, present you has to get this stuff done, yes, but future you is also going to have expectations. And if you don't take care of present you, future you is not going to be in a position to be able to handle it. Olivia, how do you think of titles for your books? Do you do it before writing or in the midst? Where do you draw inspiration from? Feeling very lost, and I always think your titles are clever and intriguing. Well, thank you. Um, So it's funny you should ask, because I'm actually thinking of retitling Inheritance. I'm not sure yet. So Inheritance has already had another title. Uh, It was called Fume of Sighs, which is a quote from Romeo and Juliet. But then I didn't like having Masters of Death. Originally, this book was going to come next, so I didn't want to have Masters of Death, Fume of Sighs. It felt redundant. Um... So then I renamed the manuscript to Inheritance, and Inheritance is one of those titles, like clean, where it doesn't make sense till you get to the end. You don't know why it's called that until you reach a certain point in the story, and then it's like, ah, and it comes together, ideally. But Inheritance is sort of a common, um, I've heard of a couple books called that at this point, so the title to me is very important, and I won't start writing something until I have even a working title, because for me, the title is indicative of the theme, basically. Basically, if I can't think of a title, that means I don't yet understand the point of the story. So, um, and this is true of chapter titles also. If I can't think of a chapter title, that means that I haven't decided why I'm writing the chapter. So to me, that's kind of a problem. Um, So I always start with a working title of what I think I'm trying, like, a goal of what I want to get done with the chapter or the story or what I want to accomplish, what I want the audience to get out of it. I want to have some idea of that before I start. If that changes, which it often does because obviously you develop things in the process of writing, then it changes. Um, 
Masters of Death was always the same. Um, Level of Tangled Vices was always the same too. Um, Inheritance, who even knows what's happening with that. Fairy Tales of the Macabre is, uh, it's a play on Tales of the Macabre by um, Edgar Allan Poe. So I kind of already knew they were darker fairy tales. Midsummer Night Dreams is a play on Mid A Midsummer's Night Dream by Shakespeare. So, I mean, obviously I already have a thematic thing going with the fairy tales. I was originally going to name Midsummer Night Dreams before I had written all the stories. I had an idea of what the stories were going to be, and I was calling them the Fairly Dreadfuls, like the Penny Dreadfuls. And, um... But then I was like, oh, no, all of these summer stories are very, like, wistful. Yeah, they're, they're whimsical almost. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to have to go with something that suits this more. So, yeah. So I guess, I mean, to answer your question, it is, it's both. It's, it has a title when I start. That title does change. Yeah, I mean, okay, so sometimes I will choose a phrase from the story which can't happen until after the story is written. Um, I will usually ask myself afterwards, too, is this the best possible name for this thing? I definitely think that if you're having difficulty titling things, that sounds right. I think you should, I think you should have difficulty titling things. I mean, the title is really important. The title is kind of your, the book's story's first impression. I definitely feel this, like, sense of mismatch when the title isn't right which I do currently feel about inheritance. <laughs> I feel very conscious of it just not locked. It just doesn't feel locked into place yet. Yeah, that, to that totally doesn't help really at all. I do a lot of daydreaming. So usually that's when the title comes to me is I will like arrange words in my head. I will think of phrases from the story or phrases I might want to use in the story or words that suit the theme. And then I will just sort of marinate on it for probably days. Like, I don't think that picking a title is something that comes to you immediately. Sometimes it does. Youth came to me immediately. Masters of Death came to me immediately also. Alpha also. I mean, what else was I going to call Alpha? But yeah. But I think more often it's a process of pondering, daydreaming. Sometimes I'll listen to music to get kind of a in the mood for something. Um, I'm very mood driven. I opened with that. So, well, I think I'm going to do one more of these before I have to leave for the month of December because I'll be traveling quite a bit. So, uh, if you have any questions that you'd like answered in next week's, I mean, it's the same deal as always. Feel free to send them to me, um, but then I'll probably be gone for a couple of weeks after that. So, if you have anything urgent, Please bring it to my ask box, inbox, whatever. Well, thank you for joining me yet again. Um, it's very fun to have you here. I hope I am still being helpful to you in some way. Um, if you want advice about the DMV, uh, I don't have any. Print out your bill beforehand if you need proof of residency, because they will not accept it on your phone. Okay, well, this has been me, Alvi Blake not writing, and I'll see you next week.